Good morning, everybody. My name is um, Neil McCullum. I've been a Christian for 42 years. I've been in the Rotary Baptist for 33 years. Um, today, I'm speaking on 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 16. Um, when Paul said me what I was to speak about, I thought it was a pretty tough one. Possibly he's passing me a bit of a lemon here, but we'll see how we go. So what I've done is I've kind of broken it down to several main points. And it's a little bit disjointed, but it's in order. So I just pray and hope that you get out of it what is meant for you. When you're doing um, a, a message or something, it's, it teaches you just as much as you in part, I believe. So what I want to do is, I'm just going to read out the introduction to Corinthians from the message, because I think it just helps us set the atmosphere. When people become Christians, they don't, at the same moment, become nice. This always comes as a, as a surprise. <coughs> Conversion to Christ and his ways doesn't automatically furnish a person with impeccable manners and suitable morales. The people of Corinth had a reputation in the ancient world as a unruly, hard-drinking, sexually promiscuous people. When Paul arrived with the message, and many of them became believers in Jesus, they brought their reputation with them right into the church. Paul spent a year and a half of them as pastor, going over the message of the good news in detail, showing them how to live out this new life of salvation and holiness as a community of believers. Then he went on his way to other towns and churches. Sometime later, Paul received a report from one of the Corinthian families that in his absence, things had gone to the pack. He also received a letter from Corinth asking for help. Factions had developed Morales were in, dis in disrepair. Worship had degenerated into a selfish craving for the supernatural. It was the kind of thing that you might have expected from the Corinthians. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is a classic of pastoral response. Affectionate, firm, clear and unswerving in the conviction that God among them, revealed in Jesus and present in his Holy Spirit, continue to be the central issue of their lives. Paul doesn't disown them as a brother and sister Christians. He doesn't throw them out because they're of their bad behaviour, and he doesn't fly in a tirade of their irresponsible ways. He takes it all or more. He takes it all in his stride, in his stride, but also takes them by the hand and goes over all the old ground again, directing them in how to work about the glorious details of God's saving love and to be loved for, for one another. So that's how he wrote the letter. That kind of sums it up. And then I've got a bit about the writer. <coughs> it's important to remember that Paul's letters were written to people and individuals that he had met and in some cases known personally. We need to bear this in mind to avoid stressing some point out of context in the spirit of the message out of context. Paul invites correction without sparring, without sparing, and certainly does not mince words or equivocate in speaking the truth to the ones he felt the ones he felt responsible for. Paul knew the people, he thinks about what he was writing, and he targets the words. Paul believed that God was in all things in his life, in the lives of the ones who the letters were meant for. And all, God is in all things for us, in things unfair and fair, things pleasant and unpleasant. Paul invites us to share this way of looking at life. So just a little bit about the, the Corinth, the town. It was not quite a city and it was not quite a town. It was just kind of in the middle. It had a good climate and it was an attractive, attractive place to be. It was by the coast, and you got good weather. It was full of former soldiers, because it was a place that the Romans, when they'd been to war, 
they get to choose where they could live and they got their pension and they could pretty much go and settle anywhere or they got given a piece of land to go and settle on. So it was a town full of ex-Roman soldiers, people who killed other people, had seen life the hard way and had a bit of a hard life. It was a town of a thousand prostitutes. There was a huge temple there to the goddess of fertility. And so it was, it was a sinful place. A little bit, maybe we would say, Kay's, Kay Road in Auckland or King's Cross in Sydney. That's kind of the impression that you would have. It had a Greek culture, so they taught philosophy. Philosophy was everything to them. It had the Roman culture, because all the army people, everything was disciplined. It was across the road from Turkey, and there you had the Persian influence, which had its kind of occult scenarios, where they did basically worshipping to spirits. There was a small Jewish group who insisted on keeping themselves separate in marriage and, and they had the Jewish cultures of the day, not eating pork and, and those things that made them stood out. And then amongst this, you had this group of Christians. It had a Roman governor who had more sense than Pilate. If he had a problem, he dealt with it. Just before Paul left, the synagogue had taken, the Jews had taken Paul to the Roman governor and said, this person is causing problems amongst us. The governor's governor of the time of Corinth knew his laws and he just said, get out of here, you guys need to sort it out. That's basically what Pilate said, should have said to Jesus. A summary of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1. It's about greeting, and then a little bit about division of the church. 1 Corinthians 2, Christ crucified in wisdom. 3, it's about divisions in the church again. 4, the ministry of apostles. 5, 6, 8, arguing among the believers. 7, marriage. 8, food offered to idols. 9, Paul's rights surrendered. 10, about idols. 11, about hats. 12 about spiritual gifts, 13 about love, 14 about prophecy and tongues, 15 about resurrection, and 16 about paying the way. When I looked at this, I asked myself the question, why was Christ crucified sitting in between one and two? He starts off talking about divisions in the church, then he goes to, to Christ crucified, and then goes back to divisions in the church. And I believe that Paul, when he started to write this letter, realised that he needed to go back to the church and just make sure that he had the basics, the basics of what they believed in, and what the death and resurrection of Christ does for us. And I just want to give you an example out of history <coughs> that Paul was trying to kind of nip in the bud. And here's just the scenario. The most common way of avoiding Christ's death is by living a life that is safe and secure, guilt-free. We have lots of tools to do this. We lead good, decent lives, pay our taxes, and do not speed in our cars. So when someone, something goes wrong, we can find a moral reason disobedience or ignorance of the biblical commands. We fool ourselves with the thoughts that the right thinking or the right behaviour, things will improve dramatically. We come into a graded environment. I only sinned a little, so my punishment should only be a little one. But as soon as we live a life like this, we turn our back on knowing Christ and knowing the cross. We run the risk of using the Bible as a set of rules and not a life to be lived. We run the risk of trying to arrange life like, like a life of good behaviour so that we escape punishment and bad things. So this is one of the reasons why Paul went back to the basics. Because he didn't want people to make that mistake. Bad things happen. We want to have 
a God who wants to be with us in the good and the bad. I want personally to be a Christian, not if something bad happens, not to be found sitting and wallowing in self-pity, but in helping others and being a cross to them. I want to be a victim, not a victor. Again, why we need the foundations. In verse 6, I'll read it out to you. However we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the, his, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what I believe Paul is saying, if the Jews and the Roman rulers at the time knew what would have happened if they crucified Christ, they wouldn't have done it. The Jews had their Torah, their law, and they had all the warnings, all the prophecies about when Jesus was coming. When the wise men went to Herod, all he did was he went and asked the scribes and said, where's Jesus going to be born? They said, definitely him. So that's all he asked, and he went out and murdered all the kids of Bethlehem. If he'd asked another question, he would have had another prophecy that there are Rachel's tears, which alludes to the fact that all the children of that Bethlehem were going to be killed. And he would have had again another prophecy that said that at some stage the Messiah is going to come out of Egypt. He didn't ask the question, he just had an idea in his head and he dealt with it. A mistake that we can also make. When it came to Pilate, he had the Roman law to go by. He had strict instructions on handle, how to handle any case. In Pilate's case, he even had a warning from his wife that came in the form of a dream. But he still didn't do what he should have done. And it was, so it's like you can look back in history and think, okay, he made a mistake, but he didn't follow his instructions. It was his mistake alone. Takes away the excuses. There are simple things out there. How often do we fail to ask the question after something happens? The people in Jesus' time often had to ask for Jesus to um, interpret his parables that he gave them. What we need is we need God's Spirit within us to be receptive. If we don't have God's Spirit, we can what out there is can be seen as full English. Now, just ask the people to, to um, got ready just to stick up a little question, a little picture on here. The engineers and the town planners said they would have to dismantle the bridge or the truck in separate pieces. A 10-year-old boy, old Sid, came along and said, let down the tyres. Now, people, we can miss the boat if we look too hard. We need God's wisdom, not our own. I just want to read out verse 10, in 10 to 13. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of the man which is in him. So it's just saying we know ourselves. Nobody else knows us, we know ourselves. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, who is from God. And that we might know the things truly given to us, freely by God. These things we speak, not in words which man wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolish to him nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But we who are spiritual, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he might instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 
So we're looking at where our wisdom comes from. And again, if we just have a look back in history, we can only look through a glass darkly. The scripture clearly tells us that. But the glass can be made clear by the wisdom that God gives us through the Spirit. And the glass, looking through the glass, is not to be filtered through other people. Just going back to the church history. In the 16th, 17th, 18th century, the Catholics essentially con controlled the church. They controlled the church through the priests, through holding the Bible, so only the priests could read the Bible, it was read in Latin. And a group of people revolted against this. The scriptures got published so the scriptures would become into common people. Now, the Baptists, our forefathers, because we say we're Baptists, held that truth and they broke away and they said, God can speak directly to us. It doesn't have to go through the priest anymore. It doesn't have to be controlled by communion. It doesn't have to be controlled by reading the word. And that's our history, church. We need to hold true to that. Different church leaders have snuck in over the years and said that only the truth is coming through me. You've got to listen to me if you want to hear the truth. Again, wrong. Paul is saying in the basics here, God is within us. He's given us his spirit. Be alive to that. Be alive to him speaking to you. It was a very early warning to the church. Don't, anyone, don't let anyone take away your direct access to God and his wisdom. Now, I just want to tell you a personal story that kind of links into this. How I feel, it's just an example of sometimes how I feel God is with me. Okay, in the 1980s, we can take that down. Um, in the 1980s, I worked for a company in Rotorua here. And on the Monday, a boss came and said to us, we've got a new contract. We're going to be fixing IVM equipment now. Okay, that's good. It was, about, it was the boss and there was three of us. On Tuesday, I got given a piece of paper that said, on the piece of paper it said, from IBM, blah, 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 please attend National Bank in Rotorua to fix in 3624. And the problem with it is a DFM. So, I said to the boss, what's this? And he said, go down and look, which was his pretty much a stand answer. So I wandered down to the National Bank, go through the doors, go through the counter, and said, I've come to fix your 3624, not knowing what it is. Go around the back, go behind the counters, go get showed to a little room, and there's a big concrete, a big solid metal door, two handles, and a combination lock on it. And the lady pointed to that. And I said to her, being a little bit smarty, can you show me what's wrong? So she opened the door for me, because I certainly didn't know how to open the door, and she pulled out a unit, and there was a little belt mechanism that picked up the money in two boxes down below, went up through the belt mechanism, and you put in your PIN number, it spat it out to you. It was a $10 note jammed in there. I didn't get to keep the note, but I did fix the machine by giving it a clean. The basics, just give the thing a clean if you don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, the gentleman from IBM turned up. And I said to him, you know, what's the story here? I went to look at something. I didn't know what it was for. I didn't even know what it was, let alone how to open it. And he said, at the top of your piece of paper, there is a phone number. When you ring that number, you get the whole of IBM. You get the... IBM for the world is at your doorstep. They will answer your question and they will help you. And he said, all you have to do is a ring. If somebody says to you, no, or doesn't help you, there's my number, give me a ring and I will sort them out. And that was when you went to any IBM job, you knew that you had that whole organisation behind you. Another job I did for them, I started off calling somebody in Auckland, I got transferred to Melbourne, then Sydney, then Perth, then I went through to some in England, and then finally I signed for midnight to 
somebody in America. They had their resources there to help you. People, when you've got God's spirit within you, you've got God's resources behind you. You've got all that wisdom, all that knowledge. You've just got everything behind you. You've got other people who have God's spirit in them that you can go and ask the minister, other elders in the church. And that's, that's what I believe this 1 Corinthians says through the basics. We have God in us. Don't let anybody take that away from us. Just be there. Let God speak to us. Okay. Just in summing up, I just want to repeat what Paul said. Paul believed that God was in all things, in his life and the lives of the one that he wrote these letters to, in things unfair and fair, things pleasant and unpleasant. And Paul invites us to share this way of looking at life. God is within us. God is there waiting for us to talk to him, to communicate. Through prayer, as Ian said, a dialogue, two-way prayers. Let God speak to us, people. So, uh, I think Paul here is going to sum up. When I agreed to do the odd message, I said, Paul, look, I'm not good on summing up. That's your job. <laughs> so, thank you. Hey, thanks, Neil, for that. Really appreciate that. I love that example of uh, IBM. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, we already uh, captured that and uh, envisaged God here. So, I just think the thing that comes to me this morning as Neil's spoken to us is about the godly wisdom, you know, just godly wisdom. And that's what the passage is about, as Neil's been about. And uh, sometimes we can listen to a whole heap of voices, a whole heap of stuff. And uh, sometimes we've just got to. Uh, I, I call it like centering ourselves back on God, isn't it? Do people, you guys have that as well, or is it just me? Yeah. Oh, it's just me. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, and I, I'm just reminded of that this morning again, just in the quiet. And uh, I just, amongst our worship time this morning, I really enjoyed um, where Tim and the team just paused us. And there was just quiet, and then there was quiet, and there was quiet. The music was just playing, and uh, just experiencing the presence of God. In that. So I'd encourage you to um, just pause and listen for God and uh, His voice and, and just put aside other voices. It's good to have advice, it's good to read stuff, but nothing beats the voice of God through His Word and uh, directly to us. So we can team up and they're going to lead us and uh, let's just um, pray as they do that. There's a prayer this morning. If you need to know fresh the voice of God today, His wisdom. Uh, just come in uh, as a song is sung, or at the end of the service, there's some people that would love to pray with you today. Let's do that. Brother, we thank you for Neil, thank you for uh, the message you've laid on his heart. I love that picture of uh, I being Lord and uh, the O800, and what we have that to you. And as uh, uh, Ian quite rightly pointed out, it's a dialogue to you. You speak to us, we speak to you. To help us to listen well to you. Your, your presence and your word uh, that you're speaking into our hearts and into our lives right now. I pray that you'll, you'll heal broken hearts here this morning. Uh, for them to heal broken hearts this morning, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.